I've got a feeling I've been here before In a jungle, in a dirty little war Young men can die so fast My God, let's not repeat the past I've got a feeling I've been here before I've got a feeling that I've been here before A welcome to Veterans Speak Out. My name is John Shushard, and I'm the, one of the Crow Directors of the House of Peace in Ipswich. Today our guest is Martin Ray uh, from <coughs> Rockport nearby. Martin is a, a veteran of Vietnam, and he has uh, done a wonderful uh, thoughtful reflection on uh, his growing up as a young man, uh, why he uh, participated in ROTC, was uh, commissioned as an officer, uh, his uh, uh, actions in Vietnam, and his uh, gradual change of heart and, and mind, uh, which is going to be shared with us uh, today. And uh, Martin has had the opportunity to uh, sit with other young people at the Gloucester High School, uh, other uh, students and uh, young men particularly uh, to share his personal his personal story uh, so I think it's a significant program uh, today and Martin we're so glad to have you uh, willing to share your story as intimately and as revealingly as yes. you do yes Martin and I are both active uh, members of the Samantha Smith chapter of Veterans for Peace Veterans for Peace is a national organization of veterans that was founded in 1985, it has chapters all across the country. Our Samantha Smith chapter was, uh, we were founding members of the chapter back in 1990, mm -hmm. and we have uh, uh, worked and witnessed for peace uh, together uh, since that time. Yes, the Veterans for Peace is an opportunity for us to give a response from our background, having served this nation on, on active duty and the discoveries, the, the, the personal evolution, the, the insights that we've gained and reflected on during our service but most particularly after we returned to, to civilian life and participated in our national community and trying to think what we can bring to the public's attention, to the national discussion, to our own personal evolution to our journeys uh, so, so we, we help each other and we also try to share this more broadly and uh, as you said John we we met in, in the really at the time of, of our initial involvement in Iraq back in 1990 but we understood then that a complete cycle in our national policy had taken place where having been Vietnam veterans and we thought that the questions that came up in, the, in those days were behind us now. We thought that our foreign policy would be sensitized and adjusted as a result of the calamity of the United States being abroad in the Vietnam War and being horrified that within our own lifetimes only 25 or 30 years later that this circle had turned again and we're still at it because the circle, that, that wheel, has not yet stopped. So we appreciate the opportunity to continue to contribute to the discussion. The talk that I have developed here called The Face of the Enemy is my attempt to personalize those historical experiences f uh, within my own life uh, to myself and, and to others. So I, I chose the title The Face of the Enemy because the talk is based on photographs of people that I met in, in Vietnam and seeing their humanity in, in the context of, of a much broader insult to, to their culture. And so I had pursued the, the, the those, those photographs, those portraits, after being impressed with, with the, the, the book The Family of Man, which is a collection of photographs from around the world, and, and how perfectly 
the people of Vietnam reflected the, the, all the peoples of the world. And secondly, that, that title, The Face of the Enemy, is meant to reveal not only their, their humanity, but the up-closeness of being a, a combatant nation within another nation, and who are these people? This is, this was a personal revelation for me, and I want to share that with you. When I reflected more after the completion of this project, it occurred to me that, to summarize the meaning of the experience for me, that I went to Vietnam to test my manhood, and I returned from Vietnam to test my humanity. My world growing up was very much like your world growing up, in that war was always present, but at a distance. The Revolutionary War gave birth to our nation, the Civil War preserved the Union, the World Wars defended freedom and democracy in the 20th century. What I knew about war was fun and exciting. The cavalry got the Indians, the Marines raised the flag at Iwo Jima, and George Washington rode a white horse. The most troubling image in my childhood occurred in the third episode of Disney's Davy Crockett, where the hero and Jim Bowie were massacred at the Alamo. In my mind, when I fought in a war, it would be quiet and bloodless and stealthy. I would pick off the enemy one by one at hundreds of yards through a scope. I would swoop through supersonically, firing magic missiles. I would be a frogman infiltrating beach barriers. In my youth, I liked to study history and geography. The United States was at the center of our world map. All the countries were represented in pastel colors with fixed outlines. Bad forces might try to change the picture, good forces would hold it together. That was the bottom line of international relations. Change was the enemy. I was born at the time of the Cold War. We and our allies were holding off the communists. Just thinking about hordes of Russians and Chinese made me shiver. Russians were bear-like and dressed in furs. Chinese had slanted eyes and were sneaky. Russians and Chinese were the enemy. While I was growing up, a little ember of the Cold War heated up in Vietnam. Vietnam is next to China. On my childhood map, it was colored purple, a French colony, so it was in our column. That was how I saw it. But then, Vietnamese nationalists fought to expel the Japanese and French occupation forces during the 1940s and 50s. They won an election in 1956 to govern their country as communists. They took aid from our enemies, the Russians and Chinese. We supported the non-communists in the South in the Civil War, at first with advisors and equipment, eventually with half a million American troops. I was one of those. I went to Vietnam to face the enemy. I went to test my manhood. I went to taste war. Now, 35 years later, I want to report to you with pictures of my story and how my view of war has changed. I am the fourth consecutive generation in my family with the name Martin H. Ray to serve my country in war. My great-grandfather earned this medal in the American Civil War. In this photograph, he is seen visiting his son Martin H. Ray II, a plebe at the U.S. Military Academy in 1906. My grandfather's four sons all graduated from the service academies and fought in World War II. Here my dad and Uncle Alan in the uniforms of West Point and Annapolis with their father, sister, and youngest brother, Roger. Uncle Roger joined my father in the invasion of Europe against Hitler. Here they are reunited with their father after both being wounded in the war and receiving the Purple Heart. Uncle Martin III received the Purple Heart too, as well as the Navy Cross, the Navy's second highest medal. He died heroically, helping to evacuate his men from their sinking ship torpedoed by the Japanese at the Battle of Midway. The Navy named this ship after him the USS Martin H. Ray. My parents gave me his name too. My father, an Army colonel, served 30 years in his career. During World War II, he met my mother, who was an Army nurse 
in Europe. A few years later, I was born at West Point, New York, where he taught military law, alongside what my father called the Majestic Hudson. We lived all over the United States, in Japan and Burma. You see a photograph of my sister and me at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where my father took artillery training. My own first experience in uniform was in the Boy Scouts, where I earned the Eagle Scout Award. When I entered college in 1964 at Johns Hopkins University, I joined the ROTC program. You can see that ROTC was a natural course for me. I believed that everyone should give a period of service to his country in some way. Mine would be in the Army. The Army gave me a scholarship to college. While in school, I competed on the intercollegiate rifle team and was elected captain of the team my senior year. It was the beginning of my familiarity with weapons on target ranges. I loved making a tight pattern of bullet holes in the center of the target. I learned how to be focused, how to breathe, ice in the veins, caressing the trigger exactly. I learned how to balance tension and relaxation, inhaling, exhaling, sweeping the rifle barrel through just the right arc to a momentary rest, and bang, a bullet was on its way to raise our score. I earned this rifle team medal to wear on my uniform and a varsity letter to wear on my school sweater. Between the junior and senior years, we cadets went off to ROTC summer camp at Indiantown Gap, Pennsylvania. There, the paper targets morphed from bullseyes to human silhouettes. We simulated the deadly business of battle with hand-to-hand -hand combat, bayonet training, thrust and parry, stabbing at straw dummies yelling, kill, kill, kill. We qualified with pistols, machine guns, grenades. We handled the new M16 rifle on the quick kill course, shooting reflexively from the hip at pop-up targets. In the jungle, Death lurked only a few feet and a fraction of a second away, with no time to aim. I earned the expert marksmanship badge to wear on my uniform. We came back to the serenity of our final year in the classroom. College graduation brought my regular army commissioning as a second lieutenant in June of 1968. I studied for six weeks at the Engineer Officer's Basic Course in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Then I took three months of the Army's toughest training at Fort Benning, Georgia. Airborne school prepared us to parachute behind enemy lines to destroy them with the element of surprise. Ranger school developed the stamina and skills of commando unit leaders. I was welcomed into the Army's elite fighters. I earned the privilege of wearing the airborne wings on my chest and the Ranger tab on my sleeve above my unit insignia. Military training is the ultimate sport. We learned our skills, we learned our roles, and primarily, we learned to work as a team. We learned to extend our abilities and our limits far beyond we, what we had thought possible. In the classroom and in the field, we exposed ourselves to the meaning of courage and exhaustion and the necessity of making life and death decisions in chaotic conditions. The Army, through every challenge they could think of, take us to the breaking point in the game, to simulate the test of battle. But we were still schoolboys. Until blood flowed, until we wasted our, our opponents, until our mates got mangled, until any breath might be our last, it was still a game. We hadn't yet hunted to the death other human beings and been hunted by them in return. What we lacked in training camp was a real enemy to hate. I entered the Army with a four-year service obligation in the Corps of Engineers. I planned to see the world. I wanted a stint of outdoor construction work after all those years in the classroom. The Vietnam War was going on, but it seemed remote to me during my first two assignments in construction units in Thailand and Germany. I wanted to build up rank and experience before going to war. We heard that second lieutenant platoon leaders had the shortest lifespan of anyone on the battlefield. In June of 1971, it was time for the final year of my contract, a transfer to Vietnam. By now, I had attained the rank of captain, eligible to be a company commander of perhaps 120 men in three or four platoons, each led by a lieutenant. After some home leave and a visit to my college roommate in British Columbia, I boarded a plane in Seattle for the flight over. 
We landed at Cameron Bay. The plane taxied to a sandbag shelter guarded by barbed wire and machine gunners. Things were getting serious. We went inside the replacement depot where the Army would match us up with its manpower needs. We would be taking the places of men who had been killed or wounded, or who had rotated home after finishing their tours of duty. Being Airborne Ranger qualified, I applied for a position with the 101st Airborne Division combat engineers who were then fighting near the DMZ, the demilitarized zone at the border with North Vietnam. I wanted to be with the sharpest troops in the country, even if they were in the thick of things. Oddly enough, I was sent to Saigon to a desk job at the Combined Intelligence Center. For the next year, I helped to prepare terrain studies for units who were slugging it out in the field, but I was stationed in a completely different world from them. During my daily commute to work, I passed through parts of the city bustling with vendors and school children. In colonial times, Saigon had been called the Paris of the East. Now it was choked with refugees forced from the countryside. Everybody was trying to make a little life for himself and his family. Here you see two young women downtown wearing aoyais, traditional Vietnamese dresses that float elegantly in the tropical heat. Around the capital city we witnessed the cost of war only indirectly, such as when my office sponsored a Christmas party at an orphanage for children whose families had been killed in the fighting. Each of us soldiers on the staff drew a weapon for emergencies. We were supposed to practice with it and keep it in good shape. But the war seemed far away. Mingling with the Vietnamese struck me as both exotic and perfectly normal. I went to homes, markets, temples, and a wedding. The groom, a pilot in the South Vietnamese Air Force, married his sweetheart as departing combatants have always done. While the family gathered for portraits, we all felt the war in the background. The bride received a sadly reassuring hug from her mother. I began to see that weapons were no longer a sport. Their real purpose began to give me a horrible feeling. Despite my years of marksmanship training, I sensed how repulsive it would be to use them against people. I'll never forget the first night I reported for security duty at the headquarters. Part of my job involved checking stations around the building armed with a 45 caliber pistol. I stared at that pistol and didn't see how I could possibly shoot somebody with it in the event of an encounter. My hand shook. I looked down at them as though they had a separate existence from me. They refused to cooperate with loading the bullets into the gun. When the briefing officer wasn't looking, I threw the ammunition clip back into the door, strapped on the empty pistol, and went out of my rounds. I never loaded that gun all year. I was fortunate to be far away from the front lines where the killing was taking place. One day I signed up for a course in photography at the Saigon Education Center. This opened up a new world for my free time in the evenings. I began to see interesting scenes in the street, like these food vendors by a movie poster. My class went out to a village on a field trip to take pictures. We passed by farmers working in rice paddies. Back in the dark room, I developed the negatives and, pre and prepared to make my first prints. I'll never forget the moment those images appeared in the developing tray. The faces of Vietnam came into focus with a universal beauty. At every opportunity, I, ex I explored Saigon in search of its human story. I took buses downtown, meandered through streets, markets, temples, and parks, taking pictures everywhere. Printing them in the isolation of the darkroom always amazed me. The noise, the dust, the heat and smells of the background disappeared. With the camera's selective lens, I entered a world where the burden of the war disappeared. In the faces, through the photographs, I saw the hopes and dreams of people everywhere. During my tour, the U.S. government became increasingly frustrated with the bloody stalemate in the Vietnam War. Over 50,000 Americans and millions of Vietnamese had died without meeting our goal of preventing the unification of the country under our communist regime. The American people had become tired of the casualties and the expense and the failure to achieve victory in a faraway land. 
our military reduced its ground troops and stepped up the bombing. Any place we suspected of enemy occupation, we pulverized from the air. Our planes saturated Vietnam with four times the explosives that the American and British forces had dropped on Germany during all of World War II. The enemy wouldn't quit. American troops were engaged in guerrilla warfare with indefinite battlefronts. The enemy was able to blend into the population and the countryside. We struggled to identify who and where they were. Since we couldn't see them, my area analysis section was asked to help draw up bombing targets on the basis of geographic probabilities. We outlined maps with likely hiding places. Sometimes the Air Force would try to confirm activity by sprinkling the designated areas with little parachute drop sensors, which could detect and radio back movements and sounds and even smells. The idea was to improve our chances of hitting somebody in the jungle. One afternoon I received an urgent order to develop targeting information by early the next day. I kept my team up working all night to prepare the recommendations and was asked to brief a general early in the morning. I went down the hall to deliver our results in the conference room. At the conclusion, the general put his hand on my shoulder and said, Well done, Captain, while my boss looked on. I felt swell. At the end of my year in country, I was awarded the Joint Services Commendation Medal by America and the Staff Service Medal First Class by the Republic of Vietnam. But that particular morning, as I walked back down the hall from the briefing room, my thoughts became cloudy. I wondered if the B-52s were on the way to waste those circles we had drawn on the map. We called the bombing strikes arc lights, or rolling thunder. We used a picture of such an airstrike on Chu Hoi leaflets to convince enemy sympathizers to switch sides. I knew that I didn't have any clear idea of whom those bombs would fall on in the countryside that day, but I had diligently led my team to choose the targets for the sake of a pat on the back. I felt unclean. I began to wonder what caused my country to intervene militarily in Vietnam to have to kill an enemy there. I wondered why I liked the medal so much. At least two million Vietnamese people like the ones in my photographs died in the tragedy. There are many points of view. At one extreme was the man who told me that we weren't prosecuting the war forcefully enough. He advocated using nuclear weapons to destroy North Vietnamese cities one by one until they quit. What about the inhabitants, I asked. Incinerate them, he replied. In Vietnam, I wrote a poem about the plight and the splendor of humanity there. Saigon, 1972. There are things that keep light from life like thunderclouds over forests and fallen leaves over bleached young shoots and the shroud of a war over a people. Blessed are the clouds that darken the skies to renew the blood of the land. Blessed are the leaves that blanket the earth to shelter and nourish its flesh. Blessed a people of blood and flesh, of spirit and soul and laugh and marrow, numb to the mystery of their shroud, yet living and loving, to illumine the shadow beneath. When these people became my enemy, they lost their right to exist. We fought to kill each other. The faces of Vietnam displayed on my wall at home remind me every day of a time when I overlooked their humanity and rediscovered it with a camera. Well, Martin, we want to thank you very much. I'm sure that your uh, deeply personal reflections and uh, the extraordinary photographs that you took uh, tell a story that's certainly very moving to me, uh, very direct and powerful, and apply your experiences to our uh, current crisis today, which is tragically, as you said at the beginning, uh, a kind of repetition of something that we uh, did not believe could be repeated uh, again uh, after uh, the tragedy of Vietnam. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your return, 
uh, how you uh, chose to you know, take up life, uh, civilian life once again here in the uh, Cape Ann area and a little bit about what you've done since. As I tried to bring out in the slideshow, one of the key moments for me was when that first photograph began to coalesce there in the developing tray and it was removed from from the circumstances so I saw just the beauty of, of that man's face and I realized that all people are you know have have that potential that 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 purity and that individuality and yet it's happening in, in, in the confusion of life. When I returned home I think I saw people differently. I saw people around the world differently and saw how precious they were and that in the in carrying out policy that we we can't ignore in fact we have to be primarily aware of the preciousness of life. In my in my upbringing, service to the community had, had been paramount and the approach that my family members took was military service to try to nurture and protect the nation. But I eventually began to see that that was necessary to try to do that in a nonviolent way rather than in a way that, that used uh, the, uh, the force of arms. So I think that we have very similar goals, but we're trying to, uh, I'm trying to ref refine the path that uh, my friends and family members have taken to, to see to what extent it's possible to pursue the vitality and the support of life without, without harming others. I returned to the United States and settled here in in Gloucester, Massachusetts, a beautiful location that I've been introduced to by my grandparent summer house. It was meant to be a, a relief from what I'd recently experienced in Vietnam, but almost immediately uh, came the period of the, of the Christmas bombing when the uh, Nixon administration as particularly as, as directed by Henry Kissinger, was trying to force the hand of the North Vietnamese in this, in this conflict. And it was a horrifying moment to many of us. So I decided to contribute my photographs of the faces of, of, of Saigon, I believe it was, it was entitled, as a, an essay, a photo essay, to our regional newspaper and they were glad to, to have that. That initiated my participation in, in the peace movement. Once again Martin, thank you very much and uh, I would suggest that our viewers uh, maybe include teachers and students and parents uh, who might invite Martin to uh, come and bring this program and uh, to their school or to their uh, congregation or even to their home uh, and uh, enter into the kind of a depth of uh, questioning uh, with Martin uh, that might be uh, very helpful to young people growing up uh, in the current confusion of uh, uh, current events. Thank you. This is Veterans Speak Out. I've got a feeling I've been here before In a jungle, in a dirty little war Young men can die so fast, my God, let's not repeat the past. I got a feeling I've been here before. Saigon, Managua, Cameron Bay, Kosovo, Inchon, Kuwait, away. What difference does our name make if we make the same mistake? I got a feeling I've been here before. I've got a feeling. I've been here before In a jungle, in a dirty little war Young men can die so fast My God, let's not repeat the past I got a feeling I've been here before I've got a feeling that I've been here before